Well, hello there, good people of the world. It's your man once again, the Big Heavy. And hopefully you've been enjoying my content with the truck videos, the power banks, some of the outdoor stuff. But I've got a bit of a confession to make. Your man's getting a little thirsty. And I know the YouTube gurus say you should stick to content that gets you likes and stick within a narrow niche and all this stuff, but I've got to believe that there's some other man, woman, or child out there that likes the outdoors, likes trucks, likes power banks, zombie apocalypses, self-improvement, all that stuff, and occasionally likes to get a little saucy. So I'd like to share with you my favorite cocktail, which I believe is the king of cocktails, and that's the Manhattan. And I'm going to share with you why I think that's the king of cocktails and how to make my Manhattan. And I've spent 20 years doing this, so at least in theory I've got it down a bit. So why is the Manhattan the ultimate cocktail? Well, there's a few reasons. One of them's personal, the others are imminently practical. So first let's go to the practical reasons. Number one, I think it's a perfect benchmark cocktail. Anthony Bourdain said something to the effect of, every human should know how to make an omelet. It's a basic tenet of cooking, it's something that's relatively easy to do, but it's also something that could take you a lifetime to master, and it's a great little thing that you can whip out and impress somebody. You know, I'll do an omelet for my kids every now and then, it wows them, it's, it brings them joy. You know, you can do an omelet for your spouse, or your significant other, or someone you're trying to impress. Manhattan's kind of the same thing. Relatively easy and straightforward to make, simple ingredients, there's only four ingredients, but it can take a lifetime to master it. Another analogy I'd give you is, is a baguette. You know, I would consider a baguette the benchmark of a, of a baker. I frankly have found very rare that somebody in, in the US can make a baguette that's on par with one you could get in France. And same idea, and actually same four ingredients. Baguette, you've got flour, water, salt, yeast. Manhattan, you've got a whiskey of some sort. Uh, classically, it's a rye. You can also use a bourbon. You've got sweet vermouth, you've got a cherry, and you've got bitters. Now you can play a little bit with those ingredients. You can you know, get a little bit colored outside the line with the ratios, but sticking with that classic Manhattan while also executing it with the proper technique is what I believe makes it a benchmark cocktail. It's a cocktail that you can use to figure out if a bar and the bartenders staffing it are serious about their craft. Anywhere in the world, pretty much, they have heard of a Manhattan and can make one off the top of their head, but you can watch how they make it and see little cues about whether or not they're serious. Probably the easiest tell is if somebody, you know, grabs a bottle of old Flint's Massachusetts bourbon from the well, pours that into a shaker with some, you know, whatever sweet vermouth they have lying around, shakes the crap out of it and gives you this frothy, frosty, you know, strange concoction without any bitters or without any love put into it and one of those insulting dessert uh, maraschino cherries that's been preserved since 1807, you know they're probably not serious and you don't want to order something a little more complex. And you contrast that with somebody that, you know, at a minimum asks you what kind of spirit you'd like in your Manhattan as, as the base whiskey, that puts a little care into it, measures the ingredients, stirs it instead of beating the crap out of it in a shaker, pours it to you in a nice glass, and you know maybe even puts a little fancier cherry in it, you know they're serious. And maybe that's a, a bartender, or you know the hipsters call them mixologists now. Maybe that's somebody you want to explore some different cocktails with, or you know do my ultimate uh, exploration, which is tell the bartender what I enjoy and have him or her make me just whatever they desire. And had a lot of fun and been exposed to some new and, and fun cocktails that way. The other great thing about Manhattan is it's a super easy drink to make at home. You know, the basics are pretty easy, the technique's pretty straightforward, you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. You know, again, there's there's essentially four pieces of equipment you need. You need some sort of vessel to stir it in, a jigger to measure out the alcohol, a bar spoon's nice, and you know, a tablespoon for your cherry. You probably already have all those things, and in a worst case scenario, you can probably scrounge enough tools from your home to, to make one properly, assuming you have some ice. On the personal side, and what really appeals to the Manhattan for me is my grandfather owned a bar in Erie, Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, I was never able to see it during my lifetime, but by all accounts, it was, you know, sort of a working man's bar. It was a kind of a hard, you know, factory worker type uh, type establishment. I've seen a few copies of the menu from back in the day. There's, I think, you know, one beer and it's literally just beer. It doesn't have any brand or anything like that. You know, there's, I think, white and red wine, and then there's five or six house cocktails. And those were for when you were feeling fancy and you wanted to do something other than just have a couple shots of whiskey chased down with a beer. And the Manhattan was on there. And my father 
and grandfather would always have Manhattans when they were together. You know, I always remember him telling stories about the bar over in Manhattan. He drank them with Canadian Club. I think that was a, a Prohibition era thing. And just to give you an idea of what type of bar this was, one of my favorite stories from that bar was my grandfather was one of the first businesses in Erie, at least by his telling, to have an alarm system in his establishment that was centrally monitored. And instead of calling the police, the central monitoring station would get a hold of him. And the rationale for that was that his biggest concern was if somebody broke into the place and the cops got there first, they would start drinking and or taking all of his booze and putting it to their cruisers. So his goal was to get to the, the bar before the police did, which gives you some indication again of, of the neighborhood and patrons of, uh, of that bar, just kind of the general scene. You know, this was back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, I think he ultimately sold it and retired in the, the 60s at some point. So let's talk through what you need to make your own Manhattan. There's two spirits in the Manhattan. It's a whiskey and sweet vermouth. The pre-prohibition recipe would call for rye. If you're going to go that route, I generally like a bullet rye. You know, I don't have any liquor sponsorships, unfortunately. If anyone would like to offer me one, I will gladly accept it. Every man has a price. Mine is quite low, but you'll see two bullet spirits and that's just because I like them. I think the bullet rye is quite good, fairly easy to find, uh, fairly inexpensive. If I'm feeling a little bit special and it's a special occasion, you know, I know this is not a true, uh, you know, rye whiskey, I guess it is a true rye whiskey. It's not a true bourbon since it's not from Kentucky, but Whistle Pig, I believe, makes this fantastic rye. This is their uh, their overproof rye. So, you know, I might lean back a little bit on this if I'm using this in a Manhattan. I might go a little heavier on the vermouth. That's kind of one of those nuances that you learn, but I think this is a spectacular rye, you know, even just a, a sipping rye. And this is one of the few spirits I put a, an ice cube or two in just to, to wind back that, uh, that overproof nature a little bit. If I'm going for bourbon, my uh, you know preference and kind of my my daily drinking Manhattan. Not to imply that I drink a Manhattan every day. I don't, but you know, sort of the the not special occasion core spirit. I use this uh, this Bullet Bourbon. What I like is it's a little. It's got a little bit more of an unrefined taste than something like a Maker's Mark or something that you use you know, kind of more of a classic sipping bourbon. Um, I like that in a Manhattan. You know, I like having a little bit of that uh, kind of harshness. Um, for lack of a better phrase, that, that sort of spirit forward nature. They call this a frontier whiskey. I think that's a, a good description. You know, it does sort of feel like it's a little bit more in your face, a little bit more rambunctious, which I think works well in a Manhattan and kind of tempers down some of the sweetness of the vermouth. So your other base spirit is going to be your vermouth. You know, I started out my Manhattan career, I think like a lot of people do with Maker's Mark, just since they advertise everywhere and have that funky wax cap. And I thought, hey, I'm classy with, uh, with a drippy red wax cap. And I'd go with the Martini and Rossi red vermouth. That was like five bucks for a, a gallon jug. Don't do that to yourself. You know, the, the vermouth is uh, is a third of the drink essentially. So get yourself something good. Um, these days I'm really into the uh, Antica formula. I'm probably not pronouncing that properly. I know this is sort of a hipster vermouth. What I'll say about the hipsters is they usually actually know what they're, they're doing. I'll outsource a lot of my work finding good products to the hipsters. I think this is a fantastic vermouth. Um, it's a little more robust. It's got a little more character. I think something like a Martini and Rossi is just sort of a filler. And it's like, hey, you know, we'll let the uh, the rye or the bourbon steal the show. You know, this guy sort of is uh, is a you know, wins best supporting actor. Next couple ingredients, the bitters, too often forgotten. And again, that's kind of one of my benchmarks. If you go into a bar, ask for Manhattan, and they don't put bitters in it. Bartenders uh, not doing what uh, what they should be. Classic is the, uh, and again, I'm gonna mangle the pronunciation on this, but hey, I've been making cocktails for 20 years and still can't pronounce it. The Angostura bitters. Um, I like to get a little funky with my bitters. You know, that's, there's a lot of new bitters out there that are kind of fun. Probably my favorite are these Bitter Cube uh, Cherry Bark Vanilla Bitters. And interestingly enough, you can get these and the cherries I'm about to show you from Amazon. I'll put links down there. It just proves the point that uh, Jeff Bezos is taking over the world when you can get bitters and Italian cherries on Amazon, but I digress. So I like these, give a little sweetness, give that little hint of vanilla. You, know, you can get around that if you like a little bit of sweetness and a little bit more of that uh, just hint of fruitiness to your Manhattans. You can put a little half a scoop of the cherry juice in there with it. Speaking of cherries, again, don't use those radioactive maraschino cherries that are, you know, you get on top of your ice cream sundae. Use something good. Uh, Luxardo is kind of the, you know, I would say the, the mass market good cherry. You can get those on Amazon. They're tasty. They're from Italy. For whatever reason, the Italians are rocking out with vermouth and cherries. Uh, I got into a couple years ago these Amarena um, Fabri cherries. They come in this 
cool looking jar. I like them a little more than the Luxardo. The Luxardo almost have this uh, you know, almost over-preserved texture. I think these have a little bit more of a, a smoothness to them. Um, the sweetness isn't as in your face. It doesn't come on as strong and they almost have a little bit more of a fresh uh, fruit texture. You know, it's, it's by no means like a cherry that just came off a tree but it's uh, compared to the Luxardo, just a little bit different. So yeah, if you're feeling up to it, grab a, a bottle of each and see what you like best and you know, have that kind of turn into your, your house cherry. These, as well as the Luxardos, are shipped in quite a bit of juice um, that they marinate the cherries in. Great for ice cream sundaes. I let the kids kind of make what we call kids cocktails that are basically sparkling water and some of the cherry juice. So a little fun you can have and invariably you're gonna have a lot of juice left when you're done to your cherries. So those are your ingredients. Again, quite simple and easy to acquire, you know, not a huge investment, not having to make your own bitters or your own um, shrubs or anything like that. All stuff you can buy at any liquor store in the known universe, uh, save for maybe the funky bitters and the funky cherries, but you can order those. And you know, if you absolutely need a Manhattan tonight and it's an emergency, I'll let you get by with just the goofy bitters and don't tell anyone I said you could, but throw a maraschino cherry in just to keep things moving. All right, so as the song goes, let's get down, let's get down to business. Take your time when you're preparing a cocktail. You know, part of what's fun about the Manhattan, again, it's simple techniques, simple ingredients, but you can have a little fun with how you prepare it and show, you know, whoever you're hopefully drinking with that you care enough to put that work into your cocktail. Or even if you're having a hootin' by yourself, as I am this evening, since the kids are in bed and my dear wife is out with her friends, you know, show yourself a little uh, little care and respect and put the uh, time in to make yourself a quality cocktail. So step one, and this is, uh, is pretty easy, get yourself your cocktail glass. Do everyone in the universe a favor and don't call this a martini glass, please. It is a cocktail glass. There's a variety of them. There's coupes, there's, you know, all sorts of things. I got these somewhere, I can't remember where, but kind of like them. Pick something you like. I would personally never drink a Manhattan on the rocks, despite the fact that I started drinking Manhattans on the rocks. Basically, usually you'll get too much ice in there. You end up with a diluted mess and halfway through your cocktail, you can't even taste it anymore. So I would always go up. The secret to the glass that I've learned, and it's kind of a flare thing as well as a practical thing, ice down and chill your glass before you start. And that'll do a couple things for you. The glass will stay a little colder. So when you pour the cocktail in there, it's not gonna warm it up. It'll give it a nice little sweat to it that kind of makes it look a little more attractive when you ultimately serve it. In order to chill your glass, it's pretty straightforward. Step one, put some ice in the glass. And yes, I have uh, ice in my bar because I probably have a drinking problem, but ignore that for now. So ice in your glass and then simply put some water in there. I'll just take a shaker and put a little uh, cool tap water in there. Nothing all that special required. and fill it up just shy of the top of the glass. You don't want to go too close to the top of the glass because as some of the ice melts, it's going to cause the water level to raise. Not the end of the world if it does, a little water will pour out the side. The other pro tip I'll give you when you have your glass set up, put it next to a sink, ideally, so you can just kind of tip it and not have to travel halfway across your kitchen or halfway across your house to dump out that cold water before you put your drink in there. So next pro tip, get your materials ready. So in this case, again, we've got pretty simple tools. I like this uh, crystal shaker. I think someone got this for me for a gift that comes with a strainer. This is a strainer, which is, has this little springy thing. Basically that lets you pour a mixed drink out of here and it catches all the ice and whatever else you put in there. You'll get something you like if you are kind of in, uh, in desperate times and don't have access to a nice a mixing jar or something like that. You can use a shaker and just use a spoon to mix in there. You can take a pint glass, put some ice in there, mix it with whatever kitchen spoon you have. Don't have to uh, worry too much. Again, part of the destination is the journey. So I like to have the, the nice tools. Um, also like to have a bar spoon. Interesting and amusing fact, the reason these have a um, 
spin to them is not so you can put them in your hand and go and make a little motorboat thing. It's actually so if you want to make a layer drink, which were popular for a, a while, um, you can put this in your cup, have this guy at the top of the, the next layer, and pour your spirit down here, and the little twisty nature will cause your alcohol to flow down the spoon, hit the bottom, and then sort of flow out very nicely without disturbing the layer below it. And apparently there's a time, I think in the 30s, when layer drinks were in, and there was some bartender in Chicago, I believe, that could make like an 18 layered cocktail. So he'd spend all this time with the bar spoon, you know, creating this elaborate layer drink, and then people would ooh and over it, and then just rip it down the hatch, and that was that. We've got our cocktail uh, cup at the ready. We've got our jigger at the ready. We've got our strainer, we've got our spoon. The thing with jiggers, uh, most of them will have some sort of measure on them. Uh, some recipes will call for you know, measures in ounces. If you're outside of the US, it'll call for it in milliliters. I would, I generally just use ratios. So for the Manhattan, it's a two to one. So depending on the size of your glasses, you could do you know, two of the big guys and you know, one of the big guys of vermouth, you could do the little guys, you can kind of figure out the size of your glasses. Um, I'm gonna use the bigger side for my glasses since that's what seems to work. Get your mixing vessel, fill that guy up with ice. No reason to be shy here. You know, I've got a lot of ice in there. It's basically just to cool down the spirits before we put them in our cocktail glass. My wife and I have had a debate about whether you should put the spirits in first and then the ice. Um, she goes, she does that routine. I put the ice in first. Apparently from the research I've done, it doesn't make any difference. You know, you're not going to impart too much liquid into your drink by virtue of doing that uh, a different sequence. Got my jigger at the ready. I like to have my spirits open and at the ready, so get my bourbon open, get my vermouth open. Now again, kind of going back to the, the art of how you make these drinks and kind of getting a feel for the materials you use, I would recommend measuring. Um, I think it makes a more consistent and precise drink, obviously. But in this case, with the bullet rye, I found I like two measures and then just a little bit uh, additional for you all out in the audience. So Manhattan's two to one. I find that works pretty well, save for that little addition. So I've got my two rise in there, add my one vermouth, and then bitters generally are measured in dashes. Depending on the bitter, I'll give it a little shake before just to kind of even out any sediment that's in there since they are herbal and there's usually some chunks of herb. Classic Manhattan calls for one dash with this particular bitter I like too and a dash is just a little shake so I'm gonna give it a little shake shake so. So there's my two dashes and then I'm going to get my cocktail spoon and just give this kind of a gentle stir in a circular motion. There's no particular magic to it. I'm kind of giving it a loose grip so that spoon can turn with the curvature of the glass and the ice. And all I'm really trying to do is mix the spirits and the ingredients together as well as cool them down. The cooling is the primary focus here. And you want to give it a good stir. You, know, you can see me, I'm probably going to stir for 30, 45 seconds, both because I'm talking to you and just because you want to stir for that long. That's, uh, that's about right. If this was a cocktail that I was shaking, you know, I'll shake the shaker till my hand is too cold to stand it. That's generally my, my benchmark on that front. So now that I've got this mixed and chilled, I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm gonna leave this here for a second and I'm gonna do a little bit of a quick operation. So number one, I am dumping the water from my cocktail glass. Hopefully you can see that's got a nice little uh, bit of condensation on there, so it looks kind of nice, has a little bit of a mysterious feel to it. I'm going to put a single cherry into my cocktail glass. My father likes a double cherry, but I'm sweet enough, so I just go one. You drop a little cherry juice in there as well, that's okay. And then I'll give my 
cocktail, another couple, three stirs, just since it's been sitting there for a second while I got my glass ready. Take my spoon out. I'm positioning the strainer so that it's lined up. Hopefully you can see that. That will make sure that it pours out properly. And I'm going to pull one side with my finger and give that guy a pour. And the knowledge of your own tools and glasses and everything will get you, you know, if you like a, a full pour, that's that's kind of what I like. It's also a good sobriety test for your guests if they're walking around spilling half their cocktail on the way over. You know, maybe it's time to ramp things back. But that's uh, that is the big heavy Manhattan. Cheers. Be kind to each other. Be well, and have an occasional drink. I think the world would be a better place if we all did that once in a while. Cheers. That'll do. Ever wonder why every talking head on YouTube asks you to hit the like and subscribe button at the end of their video? You were right, because we're living in a computer simulation. And our benevolent robotic overlords get just a little bit of energy every time you hit that like. So do me, the rest of civilization, and our benevolent robotic overlords a favor. Match that subscribe, be kind to each other, keep living your simulated dreams.